the architecture of loneliness reflections on displacement and welcoming edited by Miki Ball published by Valitz Miki Ball and Ernst van Alpen wrote this book deals with the loneliness of solitary people submerged in crowds the strongest example because most visible and concrete is perhaps that of refugees people escaping from dangerous situations at home who land in a place where they don't know anyone, don't speak or understand the language and have no place where they are welcome to stay. They are alone, but at the same time are surrounded by others, are even densely pressured by those crowds. But there are many other social situations of loneliness of lonesome persons surrounded by crowds, and more recently those situations have increased in number and intensity. The COVID-19 pandemic and subsequent lockdowns cut off many people from their colleagues at their place of work and confronted them with acute loneliness. Also, young people, especially young men from individualistic cultures, are now more at risk of being lonely than they were some decades ago. The number of suicides among young men is increasing in many weird countries. As Wabi Long explains in this volume, weird countries are countries that are Western, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic. All these qualities, which are the most privileged in the globalized world, have as their flip side the condition of loneliness, with suicide sometimes as the ultimate consequence. Long also points out that in the United Kingdom, loneliness is considered an epidemic and consequently a public health issue. This diagnosis of the public health of UK citizens even resulted in the appointment of the first ever Minister of Loneliness in 2018. The feeling of loneliness of the individual points to a problem in the social domain. Relationality with others is hampered or even broken, resulting in feelings of loneliness. When we consider loneliness, to allude to Rousseau as a hampered social contract, it becomes clear that loneliness occurs in social relations that manifest themselves spatially. Although the ability to be in relation with others is first of all a psychic quality, it takes place in space. That is why the best way to imagine loneliness is within spatial architectural parameters. Loneliness is felt in tangible, material situations. We call it architecture to foreground the material conditions in which the feeling of loneliness occurs, but can also be remedied by hospitality. Loneliness here is seen as an emotional state, as distinct from its near synonym solitude, which can be considered as an ambivalent situation entailing a variety of responses. We consider solitude and loneliness as contrasting, perhaps even opposed, emotional situations. One can be relieved of the pressures of everyday life and work when solitude can provide relaxation and time for creative thinking. It can thus be positive, productive, encountering creativity. Whereas someone in solitude withdraws from social relations, a lonely person suffers from the lack of these. Loneliness, therefore, in contrast to solitude, is a hard, difficult emotion. It tends to be caused by situations that frustrate, disappoint, even fill someone with fear, horror and grief. The paradoxical situation of a lone person submerged in a busy crowd of unknown others is at the heart of the reflections presented here. Where does loneliness come from? As a difficult, problematic emotion, loneliness can have its roots in childhood experiences, but already there, social causes cannot be discarded. We begin with a chapter by psychologist Wabi Long titled Finding the Other, Thoughts on Recognition and the Stranger Within. This reflection, enriched with autobiographical anecdotes, opens up a great variety of backgrounds and causes of a feeling of loneliness. 
coming himself from a culturally mixed background, the author lays out what kind of relationship of the outside world emerged from these experiences, from plain hide and seek to later difficulties of relating to others, from the individual insecurity of the young person to later situations where fleeing is the only option for survival, individual and social aspects are densely merged. The author brings together a great many aspects, situations, developments and experimentations that all contribute to the feeling of loneliness that characterizes the lives of migrants, asylum seekers or refugees on the road. In the essay, his profound insights as psychologists into the difficulty of not only encountering but finding others on more than an anecdotal level are fused with his personal memories of such encounters. This mixture of academic and personal responses to the world's modes of making life difficult for people compelled us to begin this book with his contribution. The search for the other who must be found is a matter of two attitudinal aspects. One is the need for recognition, which brings with it the indispensable respect for the foreigner's humanity. The other is a condition for everyone to be able to provide that recognition, to see how it connects to the self. The other within makes the self recognizably similar to the other, and that sense of similarity undermines the idea of otherness or alterity. This helps to at least take the radical differentiation out of those who now become partners in the encounter. But such crucial encounters don't just happen, they must be constructed, prepared. They emerge from a wish to make them possible. In light of this book, the right verb, the most sharply relevant one, would be to build. How can one build such a solid ground for encounter through recognition and respect? This becomes the central reflection in the second chapter by philosopher and image thinker Marie-José Monzain, famous for her analysis for ancient Byzantine conceptions of the image, the author takes her sources from many different areas. Montzain begins by putting attitudes, events and things on the same level. In her writing, therefore, the verb building takes a literal meaning. This is how the noun architecture came up for our title. In a thorough analysis of philosophical thoughts, derived from a great variety of backgrounds, she takes up concepts, terms and issues that are in fact both theoretical and concretely architectural. This brings forward a rich and enriching metaphor. She ponders how, in the recent history of migratory movements and what we call with a non-existing word refugee dom, the construction of the home as the architectural and emotional place where encounters can happen. This becomes her focus. Continuing the metaphor, she gives meaning to such banal-sounding elements as doors, thresholds, walls, windows, a bench in front of the house, and more. We take these elements for granted, we don't reflect on them, but Montzain makes us consider their function in the social process of inside-outside exchange. These components of material houses that make them into social and personal homes are the connections between the private and the social, allowing a connection between the self and the other. In her reflection, they come to embody hospitality, for there, at those traditional elements, the recognition and respect can take shape, not only mentally, but concretely, in life. In that view, when ethics and political join forces, hospitality becomes an architectural form. The third chapter, by psychoanalyst Lizienne Ramantovitz, discusses a form of loneliness that is frequent in the world today, but not easily identified as such. As a practicing psychoanalyst, Lamantovitz reflects on the consequences of the development of social networks on the Internet for the loneliness crowd contrast. Whereas loneliness in the crowd has become the paradigm of the industrialized modern world, a loneliness that since the 19th century became indistinct as the result of the harmful effects of a dehumanized world, it has received a completely new dimension with internet platform culture. 
She is experienced in probing the consequences of being alone in front of a computer screen in the illusion that the internet friends undercut or diffuse the loneliness. The connected isolation one has on the internet simulates the contradictory need of the individual to be simultaneously acknowledged by others and be able to hide from them. Internet users who spend much time alone with their screens often indulge in conspiracy theories which produces a community-like ensemble without relationships. Rather than compensating from the social loneliness that rages through the world, this type of connecting can also aggravate the loneliness due to its deceptive illusion of peer group support. As Lamantovitz argues, there is no reassuring bodily presence the psychic good breast, which is the condition of a reassuring affective relationship. On the internet, bodies never meet. Thus, the individual is cut off from sensation in favor of a refuge in the imaginary, or rather the virtual, which is not the same, even the opposite, and which does not allow the elaboration of psychic conflicts and of live-through drives. As a result, on the internet identity becomes a being identical to the self, rather than a unique identity for everyone that is constructed through the permanent exchanges of everyone with others. To conclude, platform culture on the internet cultivates narcissist personalities and provides an ideal context for them. Together, then, these three in-depth studies on how loneliness takes form complement one another and provide insight into that intolerable situation of people who, surrounded by crowds, are incurably lonely. And, unless as a society we build on, let's say, Montaigne's architecture of welcoming, or, with Long, we explore the social attitudes in different foreign countries, we cannot understand that and how that excruciating situation can be alleviated.